Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's good to see you guys. Everybody doing well? Today's an exciting day for all of us football fans. I know the wives are all excited. I've got the best wife in the world. You know, like, I can go play golf and ride motorcycles and watch football, and she just lets me. She's just like, have fun. I love you. Be careful. I'm like, this is awesome. This is great. She was one years ago. I got a motorcycle. This is back in early 2000s. And uh, she had gone. She was working in interior design, and she went to uh, this client's house one time. And uh, the guy had just bought a Harley, and the guy and his wife were there. And so the guy fired it up in the garage, and um, she came home, and she said, you have to get one of those. And I was like, yes, that's like every man's dream for his wife to come home and say, you got to get a Harley. I was like, yeah. So anyway, we're going to have a great time today, though, this service. I believe God's going to speak to you. He already has. I believe in worship. Isn't God just so faithful, man? Worship is incredible. And, uh, but then tonight, tonight is going to be our night of worship. It's going to be awesome. How many of you have been to a night of worship before? Let me see your hands. If you haven't, come on out. Our experience night of worship or our encounter night of worship is that. We just come together. We worship God together. There's no real agenda. Our worship team is here. And we just, man, we just go after God with all of our hearts. And uh, you can clap. You can raise your hand. You can sit down. You can do whatever you want to do. But uh, we'll pack this place out tonight because it's going to be awesome. So come on out, worship with us. We're going to blow the top off this building just with worship and praise to God tonight. And the other exciting thing is we have, I think, more than 30 people getting baptized tonight, which is super exciting. And uh, if you need to be water baptized, and, you know, I preached on this two weeks ago. And water baptism is uh, not only our uh, personal declaration, but it's our public declaration of saying, hey, I'm one of, I am one of those. I'm one of those followers of Jesus, and I want the whole world to know about it. So if you want to be water baptized, then please be sure at the end of this worship experience, go to the lobby, and uh, we have a sign-up sheet there, and then be here at 5.30 tonight. We've got a short little class that we do just to kind of help you and let you know exactly how long we'll hold you under the water. And uh, no, we, we don't hold you under longer than about three or four minutes. I'm just joking. I don't want to freak people out there like, is he being serious? No, it's just down and up, all right? So, uh, yeah, we'd love for you to be baptized if you haven't been baptized. And then secondly, this is uh, the week that we kick off our community group sign-ups. This is always an exciting time for us. And when you came in, you received a catalog that has more than 30 groups that we have that we're offering this semester. A lot of exciting things, a lot of good things. And, you know, more than half of our church participates in a small group. We're not satisfied with that. That's a great statistic, but we want to see 100% of our church participating in a small group. You know, people grow best when they're in community. When people are Lone Ranger Christians, there's usually little growth that takes place. You know, God never called us to be a Lone Ranger Christian. There's no model for that anywhere throughout the Gospels of, you know, people just sitting around and they're going to be all by themselves and I'm going to grow personally by myself and you know, I'm going to sit at home and watch TV. You know, there are people that just sit at home and all they do is watch Christian television and this is the way I'm going to grow. I'm not against Christian television. Some of it, I think, is a little goofy, but I'm not against all of it. You know what I mean? But, but the way we grow best is in community. It really is. It's in community. It's us being together. And so I want to challenge you. Please be sure to sign up for a small group today. Um, we had record number signups last night in our Saturday night service and uh, so I know that we're going to have a great weekend with that on your way out today. In the lobby, there will be some people there with iPa- iPads and computers and all that, and we can help you sign up for a group today or you can do it online. So uh, sign up for a group. It's going to be really, really cool, okay? Open your Bible with me to Romans chapter 8. We kicked off our new series last week called DNA, and what we're looking at is who we are in Christ because when you gave your life to Christ, now listen, this is the second service, and I'm going to need some good amens. You're wide awake. So I'm going to need you to get all involved in this message with me because I'm going to be sharing some things and the better you amen, the better I'll preach today. Amen? Amen. All right, that's awesome. But we looked at last week, we talked about the DNA, the spiritual DNA that when we receive Christ as Lord of our lives and we receive that new life, that there is this transformation that takes place that we now have the DNA of Jesus in our life. And last week we looked at Romans chapter 8 
the very first part that said, therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That when God looks at us, he sees us as the righteousness of Christ Jesus. When God looks at your life as a follower of Jesus, he doesn't see you with all the junk and all the debris and all the stuff that's got you all messed up in life. What he sees is the righteousness of Christ. He sees the spiritual DNA of Jesus in your life. Now, one of the things that happens is that we don't always know exactly who we are in Christ or the benefits that we have in living our lives with the spiritual DNA of Christ. And so that's what this series is. We're looking at Romans chapter 8, discovering who we are in Christ Jesus. And one of the things, like I said last week, is I am declared not guilty. I am no longer condemned. Jesus paid the penalty for me on the cross. He took the guilt so that I wouldn't have to, and so I'm not guilty. I don't have to live with guilt and condemnation. Now, the second thing that we want to talk about today in our DNA, the spiritual DNA of our lives, is that with Christ, as a follower of Jesus, we are now spiritually minded. We are now spiritually minded that I once was controlled by this old carnal mind that was really, really messed up. But in Christ now, I have a new mind. And actually, 1 Corinthians talks about it, that we have now the mind of Christ. I can now think like Jesus. Isn't that good news? That I can now think like Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean that I always do because it's a process of development. I had something really cool happen to me in the lobby after last service as this young man came up to me and has been going to our church for about a year. And he said, I just want to tell you what you were talking about today with a spiritual mind. He said, I have just watched my mind develop over this past year. He said, I am so much more spiritually minded today than I've ever been before. And he said, it's just great to see the growth that God is doing, not only in my life, but in my mind. I'm thinking different. And he even said, it was cool listening to his words. He said, doesn't mean that everything's changed. And that all my circumstances have changed, he said, but I just know how to approach life differently now. I just know how to approach life differently now. So that was just really encouraging. But I want us to look at Romans chapter 8. We're going to start in verse 5. It says this in Romans 8, 5. It says, those who live according to their flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. I love that. That being spiritually minded, having the mind governed by the Spirit, that there is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. But you, however... You are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, are you catching this? Are you, are, you, are you listening? Are you, are you hearing what this is saying? I mean, you're, you're reading it on the screen, but listen to this. And, and, if the, this. and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, you realize that, that, the, that the same spirit, the same Holy Spirit that quickened the life of Jesus back from the dead, who resurrected Jesus, the spirit of God inside of him, who resurrected him from the dead, lives inside of you. He lives inside of you. That's part of your spiritual DNA. If you just sit around like, well, that's really cool. You're missing it because in Christ, man, you have way more than you can even imagine. The same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives inside of you. See, when I got Jesus, man, I got a good thing. I got, I, I got a spiritual mind when I received Christ. I now have the mind of Christ. And, and I think sometimes we have this idea that, that when Jesus died, one of the things that Jesus came to do was to help good people be better. Well, Jesus must have come and, you know, here's my old address. This is the place that I live. Here's my mindset. And what Jesus does is Jesus comes. This is, this is the thought we have. Jesus comes into my mind and he helps me clean things up. He, he, Jesus didn't come to make good people better. Listen to me. He didn't come to make good people better. Jesus didn't come to make broken people feel better about their brokenness. Jesus came to make dead people live. 
Jesus came to make broken people whole. He came not to leave you at your old address and help you just clean up some of the stuff in your old life. He came along and he said, you know what? I want you to leave the old house. I want you to leave the old way of thinking. I've got something brand new for you over here. You don't have to stay in the old place. You don't have to stay there. And so in Christ, we have this new mind, this new spiritual mind. And, and this new spiritual mind that we have, you've got to understand the things that we can do with the new spiritual mind that we have because our mind is now set on what the Spirit desires. Our mind is not governed by the flesh anymore, Paul is saying, that it is now based on what the Spirit desires. It means that it now, rather than craving the sins of life and the sinfulness, now it craves the things of Jesus. The new mind that we have wants what Jesus wants. And as a result, we walk in the Spirit. We stay in step with the Spirit. I'm no longer controlled by the sinful desires. And here's the other exciting thing, and I love this. I love this about the spiritual mind that I have in Christ, is that now I have greater discernment and wisdom from God. See, now there is a re revelation that I have, because before I was operating with an old mindset, before I operated with this mindset that was hostile towards God. And so there was no way for me to understand the revelation of God. There was no way for me to be able to discern the wisdom of God. And see, I'm finite. God is infinite, but now I have his mind. I have the mind of Jesus, so now I am able to think the thoughts of God. Jesus is living on the inside of me. The spiritual mind that I have now is able to think and, and operate my life with discernment in wisdom. And what does it say? As a result, what happens in verse 6? Life and peace. I've watched my own personal life over the last six or seven years kind of just take a whole new trajectory. I, I, you know, I, I've realized, I've talked about this, and I think it's just been such a revelation for me in the past few months and just, just how much Jesus has done in my life lately. Jesus has done so much in my life. He's done so much in my heart and in my mind. And, and I think I understand that. And what has really brought me to that revelation is seeing that I live so much of my life now with peace. With the peace of God. Some of you guys are living all stressed out and you're all bent out of shape. And you don't have to live that way. You don't have to live that way. Yeah, sure, I still have things that happen in my life. I still have things that, you know, catch me off guard and things that come out of me from left field and things that, you know, kind of try to knock me off center. But even when those things are happening, I'm spiritually minded. We have the mind of Christ. And as a result of that, we can live with life and peace. We can still lay down and go to sleep at night with peace in our minds. And I'm going to talk about this here in just a couple of moments, how that happens. But don't you want to live your life that way? Don't you want to live your life with peace in your mind that regardless of what's happening in life, that you can have peace, you can have direction, you can have clarity? You know, I've shared this before that when I wake up each morning, one of the things that I do just in my mind is I just go through a quick little prayer. It's one of the first things that happens in my mind. Lord, today, and I'd say this walking while I'm still half asleep. Lord, today, I want my life to be governed by you. I submit myself to the things of you. I submit myself to the Holy Spirit, to the perfect will of God, and I pray that the decisions that I make today would reflect the will of God. That short little prayer, I want to tell you, that short little prayer brings my life into alignment, and it keeps me walking with the, the discernment and wisdom of God. And as a result of that, look what happens. I live my life. I'm able to walk each day knowing that the decisions that I make throughout the day reflect the wisdom and discernment of God. Why? Because I've submitted my mind to his lordship. I've submitted my mind to Christ. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't get off track sometimes. I'm in no way, it means, no way saying that I'm perfect because we're imperfect, aren't we? Man, I'm ready to jump ahead of myself. So many things I want to share with you in these next two hours. <laughs> Last night, I was on a roll and my time was up and I'm like, I still have so much to say. Some of you guys are going to be like, well, you know football starts at 1 o'clock, so you better. I have a prophetic gifting. I can tell you who's going to win anyway. All right, so how, how do we live? How do we live spiritually minded? 
Okay, we have this new mind in Christ. We have this new mind that we are now governed by over here, governed by the Spirit, no longer by the flesh. How do we live in that mindset? How do we get to that place? Go with me to Romans chapter 12. I want to just show you a few ways. Throw a little application on here and help you discover. Look at this, Romans chapter 12. I, I'm going to read it. I got this passage memorized in the NIV, but I want to read it. I read this passage in the New Living Translation, and I just thought it kind of captured really the, the real essence of, essence of what I wanted to communicate. But Romans 12, 2 tells us really how to begin that process of living spiritually minded. And here's the first thing that we do is we begin to renew our mind. Look at what Paul said. He said, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then, look at this, look at the result of this. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Let God, I I love this part. Really, there's, you know, there there are three things that happen here in this verse, in verse 2. Look at this very first part. It says, if if you want to live your life spiritually minded, you want to be governed by the Spirit, no longer by the old address, you want to move away from the old address to the new mind that God has for you and that you, re- that you received in Christ. He says, do this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Stop being a copycat to the things around you. Stop copying the world. Isn't that what advertising is? So much of advertising, we are, you just don't even realize how heavily influenced we are by the world. We are so heavily influenced to, first of all, live our lives dissatisfied. There's always something new, always something better. Bryce said to me yesterday, he was at home, and I got him this little machine, computer, drum pad, whatever it's called, for Christmas last year. And he came up to me, he said, man, I wish I would have waited one year because now they have a brand new model. I said, that's great. You're married now. You're not getting it. (laughs) Buy it yourself. I'm done. I've done my deed, you know. And, and, but it just made me think. It's like that in everything that we have in life. There's this constant advertising teaching us and always wanting to train us to be discontent with what we have. Always copying, always trying to copy, and that's what the advertising, hey, copy this or emulate this or pattern yourself after this. And Paul is saying this, stop doing that. Stop copying the world. Start, stop trying to emulate the world. Stop trying to, you know, look at the patterns of this world. Don't custom yourself after the patterns of this world anymore. But just look at, put the scripture back up there for me if you would. Look at this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but try a little harder to become a new person. That's what it says, right? But try just a little bit harder. But what? But let God, what? But let God transform you. So listen to me. Stop trying. This is, I hope this is going to be some good revelation for somebody here today. To stop trying. Here's what the enemy does. Here's the way the enemy works in our life. We receive Christ. We have this new mind. We have this new address over here. But the enemy wants to keep you in the old house. He wants to keep you in the old mindset over here. So what he does is say, hey, God's going to come in and help you, and he's just going to help you clean it up a little bit. And if you'll try really, really hard, if you'll just work it really, really hard at being a good person and being a good Christian, then you'll be able to win the approval of God. Remember what I said? Jesus didn't come just to help clean up the old place. He came to give you a new address. He came to give you a brand new way of thinking, a brand new way, a brand new mindset. But the enemy keeps us locked in over here. I I have to try harder. I tried, oh, I fell last week. I did this wrong. I did this wrong. But I'm going to try harder. I can't tell you how many times I've met with people, and that's the words they say. I'm going to try a little bit harder. Pastor Ed, I really fell last week. I really, really blew it. But I'm going to try a little bit harder. And as a result, what do we do? We make it all about willpower. It's not about, understand me, it's not about willpower, it's about spirit power. It's about the same spirit who raised Christ from the dead is living in you. I don't need my willpower, I need the spirit's power to transform my thinking. Because it didn't work for me over here. I tried it that way, I tried, 
I tried in my own willpower. I tried to do the right thing, and I was still lost. I was still living in the junk. I was still living in the sin. I was still living with the old mindset. So thinking that Jesus is going to come in, just help me try harder, is the wrong way to think. It says, let God transform you. Let God transform you. By what? By what? Look, throw, throw it back up there real quick. Look at this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a what? A new person. You've got a new mind. You've got a new address by changing the way you think. Changing the way you think. I was, Friday, I was at Costco, and I was picking up some healthy food. <laughs> Always. Actually, one of the things that I was looking at in Costco, I didn't even tell Christy. I was like, we need to get a little freezer for outside. in our, Because, you know, this freezer that we have in our kitchen doesn't hold all that it needs to. This, you know, we need variety. I don't just, I, I need, at least me, you know, I mean, I'm an ice cream connoisseur. I need, I need some variety, you know what I mean? And this little freezer that we have doesn't quite do the job as far as keeping all the flavors that need, especially when I go to Publix and they have that buy one, get one free briars. I'll come home, I anything at Publix that's buy one, get one free. Chrissy, am I right? It doesn't matter. Hey, look, Fruit Loops, buy one, get one free. I got six boxes. Somewhere we're going to save three bucks, you know what I mean? Hey, look at this, buy one, get one free salad dressings. I got 12 of them. She's like, what in the world are you doing? You know, what's wrong with you? And so one, I looked at Costco. I was like, we need to get a freezer, you know, for out in the, for out in the garage. But anyway, here, here's the crazy thing. Uh, many of you know I moved back in February to a place. I was living up in Estero, but I moved uh, to another house in Estero. And uh, we had been at our other place for several years. And, uh, but anyways, I was driving back from Costco, and do you ever drive and you just kind of zone out? Anybody do that? Men? Amen? <laughs> I've literally driven before, and a lot of times I'm supposed to get off on corkscrew, and I'm like a colonial, you know, up in Fort Myers. I'm like, where am I? You know what I mean? All of a sudden, you got to turn around and come back, and... Recently, I can't remember, we were somewhere recently, and, oh, I think it was with Brooke last week, I was in Colorado, and she's like, Dad, you just totally missed the exit. And I'm like, be quiet, I'm thinking about something. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I was just driving, and I was just kind of zoned out. I was just, my mind was just kind of out of it. And now here I've lived at my other place now for almost six months, and without even thinking about it, leaving, driving from Costco, I turned at my old place. I turned and went into the entrance of the old place that I used to li live at, and I sat at the guard gate. And I was just sitting there. You know, you know, you got the gate where the residents go through and then the place where they interrogate you and do the strip search, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, those two places. Well, I was at the residence gate, and I'm sitting there like, why isn't the gate opening? <laughs> What's wrong with this gate? You know, it's crazy. And then all of a sudden I realized, I don't live here anymore. That's the problem. I don't live here. It's been six months, Ed. You don't live here anymore. Fortunately, nobody was around, and I put it in reverse and waved at the security guard as I backed up and, you know, did a U-turn and pulled away. Well, why did I do that? Let me tell you why. Because for years, my mind was patterned to think that way. I didn't even have to... It just happened. It just... My body reacted to what was in my mind. It just naturally happened. I just naturally turned in that until finally I realized, hey, I don't live here anymore. I need to do a U-turn. I need to turn around. I need to go back to the new address. Now you see how the Spirit works in our minds. It doesn't mean that we're not from time to time because for some of you, you lived this way for 20, 30, 40 years. And it may take a little time for the patterns of your mind to change. But God comes along and he transform our, transforms our thinking and begins to give us a new way of thinking. And here's the, and let me even throw this condemnation part in from last week. You know, here's what the enemy does. The enemy sits in the seat with us when we go back to the old place. You are so stupid. 
Don't you, you don't live here. What, you're so stupid. You're so stupid for even driving over here. Nothing can even be done for you. What do you think? What do you, what, what, what do you think's going on with you? You can't, how are you going to ever get to the old place? All you think about is the, the old place. You're never going to be able to live in the new place. This is all you think about. Here's what the Holy Spirit does. I may turn into the old place, and I may give in to the old pattern, and I may sit at the gate of the old mind. But the Holy Spirit nudges me and says, Hey, Ed, you turn. You don't live here anymore. You don't, you don't live in this place anymore. Now, I want to remind you, you go out here and you turn left, and then you turn left on corkscrew, and you go, let's get you back on the right track. Let's get you in the right mindset. Let's get you to the right place in your mind where you're spiritually minded. You see, that's the difference between how you know what is condemnation and conviction. I'm back on last week's message. It's just all in me right now. It's all Romans 8 passage. But God wants to give you a new way of thinking. And it says, let God transform your thinking. Let Him change you. And then let's look at this second part. Here, here's another thing that needs to happen is we begin to allow God to transform our thinking. It means that we now need to release control to the Holy Spirit. Release control to the Holy Spirit. Let me read this passage to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, But it was to us that God revealed these things by His Spirit, for his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thought, thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things that God has freely given us. Do you, listen, to what this, listen to what Paul is saying. This is so critical. He's saying the spirit of God lives in you. And as a result of that, you can know the thoughts of God. Do you want to know the will? Let me ask you, how many of you want to know the will of God for your life? Live spiritually minded. It doesn't have to be a lot of guesswork. It doesn't have to be, I want you to understand, God wants to show you his will for your life more than you want it. You don't have to beg and plead and what's going to happen and God wants to reveal himself to you he wants you to understand the thoughts and intentions and the heart of who he is more than you even desire and it's the spirit who knows God's thoughts verse 12 and we have received God's spirit not the world's spirit so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us when we tell you these things we do not use words that come from human wisdom but instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. Verse 14. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. That's why sometimes you may be able to, you, you may be trying to speak to somebody or talk to them about spiritual matters in your life and they're like, well, what are you talking about? Well, I don't even understand that. Why? Because it's the Spirit of God that gives us revelation and illumination to the heart of God. It's the Spirit who reveals spiritual issues to us and spiritual matters to us. That's why you're here today, isn't it? Because you wanted spiritual matters revealed to you. If you didn't want spiritual matters revealed to you, you would just stayed at home and stayed in your own carnal way of thinking. But you said, no, it was the Holy Spirit that drew you, that compelled you to say, I want to think a new way. I want to live my life a different way. I want to pursue the things of God. That was the Spirit of God that did that. That right there is evidence that the Holy Spirit, just you being here today, I'm getting wound up, just you being here today is evidence of the Holy Spirit at work in your mind. You may not have even been paying attention to him. You may not even know where that's coming from, but your desire just to get up and get dressed and be here is the Spirit of God drawing you, saying, come on, let's make sure you get to the right address. Don't stay in the old way. I don't even know where I am right now. Let's see. I think I'm in verse 15. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. For... Who can know the Lord's thoughts? And who, who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things. Look at this. For we have the mind of Christ. 
we are able to understand the heart of God in spiritual matters in what God wants in the world and what God wants with us. Why? Because we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Let me ask you a quick question. Let me just, let me just throw this out. Let me just ask you this. Do you ever have the need to control things? I'm stepping on some toes. Pastor Ed, you went from preaching to kind of messing with me now. You need to leave me alone. Don't be messing with me now. You ever have a need to control things or want to be in control? Or how about this? You pray, you want God's will, but just in case, just in case that somehow he misses it, just in case there are bigger world issues going on, just in case somehow he doesn't hear you, then I've got a backup plan. I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask for God's will, but I've got a backup plan in case he doesn't come through. That's not allowing your mind to be controlled by the Spirit. What that is, is saying, I don't trust God. I trust you just a little bit, but not enough to let you control my mind. I think I did a series, Angie, you may have remembered, I think I did a series when we were in Charlotte called Mind Control. Who's in control of your mind? That'd be a great series to do here. Who's in control of your mind? You don't always have to be in control. If you don't understand some things, being spiritually minded says, I don't understand, but you know what? I trust God. I trust Him. I, I trust the new place that He's taken me to. Because when I look at the old address, when I look at the old address of my mind, there was an enormous mortgage associated with that, and I was upside down. Matter of fact, it was so steep, they were coming after me. And it wasn't just for my money, it was for my life. And I had this old way over here, and it was decrepit, and it was broke down. And all of a sudden, Jesus gave me a new residence. He gave my mind a new place. I have a new mind. I have a new place over here. I have a new address that is rent-free, that is mortgage-free, the deed has been pay paid for, and it's nicer than anything you can possibly imagine. I want to live my life over here. I don't want to keep going back to the old address. There's nothing for me over there. There's nothing for my mind over here. I want to live over here where the Holy Spirit is in control. I want to live over here under the residence and under the influence of the Holy Spirit, not under the satanic influence of the world. I want the Holy Spirit now to control my mind. I want to begin to rethink in a new way. I want to begin to rethink. I want to think the things of God. I want to think the heart of God. We want to read one last scripture to you. Colossians chapter 3. Jenny, come up if you would. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Look at this. Since then you have been raised with Christ. You've been raised with Christ. There's a new spirit, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now is living on the inside of you. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Look at the second part. I love this. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Set your mind on things above. If I got a chance to maybe sit down with you and ask you a few questions, maybe just three or four questions, I could probably find out where your mind is going. Whether your mind is set on things above or things on the earth or fleshly things. If I just had a couple of moments, I could probably distinguish that really, really quick. And here's the thing. What you feed grows. If you will set your mind on things above where Christ is seated, if you set your mind up there and you begin to fix your thoughts on those things of God, and I didn't, uh, did I read Philippians 4.8? I don't think I did. In this, uh, read Philippians 4.8 later. It tells us what to set our minds on. It tells us what things to think about. And if you begin to get your mind set on those things and you begin to feed your mind the spiritual things and the things of God, you'll find yourself elevated to a whole new place spiritually. You'll find yourself not just visiting your spiritual mind every once in a while. You'll find yourself living there establishing new patterns, new ways, new thought processes. 
What you feed grows. That's why it's so critical. Listen to me. That's why it's so critical that you minimize worldly influence and maximize godly influence. That's why things like coming to church are so important. That's why it's so important to be here. Why? Because it's, I understand, and I hope this isn't your only, the only spiritual substance that happens in your life throughout the week, but this is at least a launching place for you to move forward spiritually, to help you grow and help you move forward. And that's why it's so critical to be here. And that's why even a small group, it is so important to be in a small group, a community group to establish community, to, to get along with other people. And may, it might be in the setting of a volleyball game. I know one of our small groups is, is, is playing volleyball. And you say, well, is there anything spiritual about that? Yes, absolutely, because there's competition involved. That's my number one spiritual gift. No, listen, because here's what happens. When I associate and I get around other like-minded people who have their mind thinking on the same thing. And I just get around them, they begin to rub off on me. And I may not be sitting there necessarily doing a Bible study and memorizing scriptures and, and having a deep prayer time, but here's the thing, their lives are rubbing off and there's community that's taking place. And even though I may not understand it, there is growth taking place in my life because I'm setting my mind on different things, things associated with other godly people. so important for our life. Listen, the Word is so critical for our life. Get the Word of God in your life. Get the Word of God. I can't stress it enough. Get the Word of God in your life. Guys, I love you so much. Get the Word of God in your life. You know, when, we're, when we do that, let me just close with this last thing and then I'll, I'll be done. Usually when people come see me, I don't think in 20 years I've ever had somebody sit down from me and say, or, or, or say, Pastor Ed, I really need to meet with you. And then they sit across from me and they say, I just want you to know everything's great in my life. Usually when people sh shoot me an email or talk to me in the lobby or different things like that, they usually, I need to talk to you about something. And usually there's some type of a crisis or a conflict or something like that when, when they want to get together and meet. And it's usually in those moments that they, they want me to pray some kind of magical prayer over them. Or they want me to lead them to the right scriptures, which I'll do. I'll lead you to scriptures and, and I'll do all those things. But I want you to know that the real training, the real good training for those critical moments takes place prior to that. It takes place in the training of our minds where we allow God to transform the way we think by thinking on things that are pure and admirable, things that are lovely, that are excellent, that are praiseworthy. When we're thinking about those things, when we have our mind set on those things, then, watch this, then we're living our life spiritually minded. So when the conflict comes along, when the conflict comes along, I don't have to call Pastor Ed. Pastor Ed, I'm in desperate need. Why? Because you already know what I'm going to tell you. You already know what the Word says. You already know what I'm going to tell you. You're going to say, in this moment, here's what the Word says. Here's the truth of the Word, and I need to do A, B, and C. And I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God. And can you imagine living your life in every circumstance, in every situation, trusting God? When that happens, guess what the product is? We just read it, Romans 8, 6, life and peace. doesn't matter what happens in life. I'm going to go to sleep at night because I know the Word, and the Word has transformed my thinking, so now my body and my actions are going to follow my mind. And I'm going to live with life and peace because I'm spiritually minded. I'm no longer controlled by the things that the old address. I'm no longer controlled by the old mindset. I've got a new pattern, a new way of thinking. And it's the mind of Christ. And that's where I'm going to live my life. And I'm going to experience the peace of God and the wisdom of God and the discernment of God. And more importantly, the destiny and the life of God. And I'm going to know exactly the places I go and the things that I do. That they're going to be led of the Holy Spirit because I am spiritually minded. I have a new DNA. I have a new mind. In Christ Jesus, bow your heads. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for every person in this place. God, I thank you that we have the mind of Christ. 
God, I thank you that you have given us the ability to think differently, even today, that, that you've given us the ability for, for revelation to sweep across our souls and to sweep across our minds for even truths that have taken place in this message that we may have never understood before, that you have given us the ability now, through the mind that we have in you, to be able to capture that truth, to be able to understand the revelation of it. And I pray that we would walk in the re revelation of this new spiritual DNA that we have in Christ Jesus, that we are spiritually minded, that our minds are no longer controlled by the world, by the flesh, but we are now governed and controlled by the Spirit. And God, I pray for those that are here today that may be struggling trying to keep everything in control or trying to control everything. Lord, just help us to release it all to you, to trust you. Lord, to, to just release those things to the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit, allow God to transform our thinking, giving us a new way to think. And Lord, we rely on you. We trust you. We trust that you know what's best for us in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to also mention to you today that if you need prayer, if you are away from God, in a couple of moments when we close this worship experience, we're going to have people that will be down here to pray, and we would love to pray for you. If you're here today and you say, I want to get my life right with Christ, I want to make sure that I have a spiritual mind. We would love to pray for you. We're going to ask you to just step out from where you are at the very end of the service, right after we've prayed the blessing prayer on you. Then we're going to ask you to come forward. Let us pray with you. We would love to agree together with you. And you can walk out of here having a new mind and a new life in Christ today. All right? Can we just give the Lord just a big hand clap of praise? Our ushers are going to come forward at this time. We're going to go ahead and receive our tithes and offering. And I want to encourage you to give. I want to encourage you strongly to give. And if you're not a giver, be a giver. Be a giver. You know, the Bible tells us to bring the first fruits of our income to God. First fruits simply means 10%. But the first 10% of all of our income belongs to who? Guess what? It's not yours. It's his. If you hang on to it, the Bible says you're stealing and you're robbing from God. There are a lot of people I'd rather rob from than God. I want to make sure that he's first in my life. And so be sure, be a giver, be a tither. God blesses, and I just pray that God would continue to expand the, the conduit, the spiritual, the financial conduit of your life, not so that you can get more, so that you can give more and be a greater blessing to the kingdom of God. Bow your heads. Father, thank you for the opportunity to give today. We worship you. It all belongs to you. It's not ours. We honor you with it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've got some cool things happening here at Living Waters. Check out our video announcements.